turn the brain off. Just stop thinking about anything except for what's coming out of the speakers and only react to what's coming out of the speakers. And a, an example of that was, uh, I think BTS Hey Mama was about 180 tracks wow. and I mixed it in seven hours. Hello and welcome to Talk Back On episode 11, guys, where we reveal what goes on from the other side of the studio glass as we share our experience and stories behind your favorite records and creatives in K-pop. We had a legend, Jay Chong, award-winning music producer and composer who's paved the way for the K-pop today. Kairos, award-winning music producer, platinum songwriter, as well as the CEO of Decade Plus Music Publishing. And I myself, KO, I'm an audio engineer behind some of your favorite records. Couple announcements. We have launched a Discord server, TikTok account, and a contest on Instagram where you follow and tag just three of your friends to win an appearance on our future episodes. We have a very special and amazing guest with us today, but on today's circuit board, we have a highly requested video on top three things I do before my mixes are sent. These are great tips and tricks that can enhance your mix and masters at the final stage. I hope you guys enjoy this one. Hey, what's up guys? It's KO here. Today on Circuit Board, we're gonna go over top three things I check before sending off a mix. So let's get right into it. So the first thing I wanna talk about is checking your session. This is a very important detail that you don't wanna miss out on. But in the case you leave something muted that was supposed to be unmuted, uh, that could lose an opportunity for you or in the worst case, piss off some people. Um, so make sure you go through every single track and make sure that it's supposed to be playing back exactly the way that it's played um, and performed. One quick tip is to commit all your MIDI into audio. And the primary reason for that is because MIDI can change uh, just adding a plugin that demands a lot more processing power. Plus on the flip side, it actually frees up some processing power and allows you to be able to mix without having to deal with possible latency in the performance. So here in Pro Tools, there's multiple ways that you can commit MIDI into audio. Uh, the easiest way is just right click and clicking on commit. Um, make sure that all the plugins that you have on there are the ones that you want to commit with. Um, or you can just bust it out to an audio track and just make sure that it records uh, with the uh, right selected input. Afterwards, you can just simply inactivate it and it will be out of your life. It is committed to audio. If you have commitment issues, you can always go back to it and be able to change the performance and re-stem it again. Another thing I'll do is check my mix on multiple playback systems. This is important, especially if you want to release your music on a major platform, uh, since there are level requirements as well as guidelines uh, for you to meet but also to send off to artists as well as companies. So let me show you some quick tips on how I like to check my mixes. So there are a couple of options uh, where I like to check my mix on. Um, Argeo is a plugin um, that allows you to stream your audio uh, to your iPhone. And this allows me to check my mix using my phone speakers. Um, and it's a great way for me to be able to do it without having to export an MP3 and uh, and just email it to myself or airdrop um, now if your song is to be released on a major platform this plugin uh, which i picked up recently known as adaptive streamliner is amazing it allows me to select a platform such as spotify apple music and even the tier where i can select the uh, from premium all the way down to mobile um, this plays back the mix in multiple different scenarios and uh, allow me to make adjustments before it goes live uh, or for release. Last but not least, check your export settings. After I'm done with my checklist, I triple check um, what I'm about to export or bounce uh, off of my mix. Uh, reason being is because you want to have the highest quality format as you can, but also be something where it could be played back on any kind of system. Last but not least, check your export settings. After I'm done with my mix and I'm ready to export or bounce, I triple check my export settings. The primary reason is to make sure 
that I'm able to get the highest quality format, but something that is easily streamable or downloadable to any uh, playback system. Your file needs to be accessible by whoever you're sending it to, and they need to be able to play it back on their system without any glitches or errors. So on Pro Tools, there are different file types. You can export it as WAV and even add an MP3. Make sure that the bit depth as well as your sample rate is locked to your session, or if you plan on dithering it down, um, that the settings are correct. Your mix is a presentation of your work. So make sure you triple check or even quadruple check uh, to make sure that it plays and nothing is muted, but also your export settings as well. Hope you guys enjoyed this one and I'll see you guys next time. Welcome back. On today's episode, we have someone very special. He is a Grammy award winning mix engineer, producer, songwriter, instrumentalist, and founder of Mixing Night Audio. From Kanye West to Jay-Z and BTS to Khalil Fong, Please welcome Ken Lewis. Woo! Whoa, whoa. Woo! Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Awesome. Ken, you've worked on so many amazing amazing projects. Can you please share with us how it all started? Um, yeah, I kind of, I brand myself now as having the weirdest resume in the entire music industry, and I, <laughs> I back that shit up. So, um, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, diverse paths that I've, I have gone down are because of Kanye West. I kind of started professionally in the music industry as a tracking engineer and then worked my way into kind of high level mix engineer. At the whole time I was producing, but I wasn't really producing super high level stuff. And then along comes this young Kanye West. Nobody really knew who Kanye was at the time. And, uh, and then the college dropout happened and we worked on the college dropout and I became the guy that or at least one of the guys on the short, short list of when Kanye had a vision for something that he wanted, but he couldn't figure out how to get it. It was call Ken, Ken will figure out how to get it. And that just became like my gig of, you know, it. he, he never asked, here's a perfect example. He never asked me if I could do things. He just assumed because I had delivered so many times before that I would. Uh, All of the lights is a perfect example when I produced the horn section on all of the lights, all of the brass is real live brass all done here. And he, he called me up and had me produce the, the brass. He never once asked me, so do you know how to produce brass? Do you know how to write for brass? Do you? So, <laughs> so all of these different roles that just took me in crazy different directions piled up so much experience and so much connectivity with other artists that it just kind of branched off into so many different genres and Kanye is just so respected throughout every genre of the industry from metal to hip hop to country to everything that they see that and they're like oh come work on my album now let's let's work to, and you know it's just a great connector and all of a sudden I'm working with people around the world I don't know how I got into k-pop well Stephen Lee got me into k-pop but Oh, okay. Um, but uh, I don't know how on earth Stephen Lee plucked me out of obscurity. But um, <laughs> he reached out to me one day and he was like, I want you to mix the Rain album. And he expected me not to know who Rain was. Because this is like 2008 when I started mixing K-pop. Wow. And, uh, and I was in Dublin at the time. And Stephen Lee reaches out via email and he's like hey can you come mix uh the new rain album and i'm like sure i'm gonna be home in four days i'm in dublin right now and he's like oh i'm so sorry we need to mix tomorrow so i said i will be home tomorrow and i was on the first flight out of dublin in the morning and mixed the whole rainism album and that was my introduction to k-pop wow. and wow. it's been grinding ever since wow <laughs> That's awesome. Um, I know Bob Horn was uh, on our show, and he's even mentioned uh, that whenever labels need help with recreating a certain sample, or uh, maybe they need some help with some of the arrangements, uh, like strings, um, they'll they'll call you up. Um, yeah, that well, that's how that's how I started with Kanye was sample recreation, and uh, and that led to crazy, crazy requests. And then that led to writing and production opportunities. Like all of the lights is not a sample recreation. That's just horns. Uh, and I sang on that too. And I ended up singing on a bunch of Kanye stuff. I, I have the weirdest resume. I, I don't, you know, it, it's, 
we just worked on the Alicia Keys record. Um, my last credit on the last Eminem album was orchestra. Um, I just produced a live orchestra for a Christmas song, which was amazing. So I just like doing shit. I'm really curious and I just like kind of new challenges and they just lead to great places. I think that really helps to have all those skill sets, right? Because I remember, you know, I, when I talked to Dave, Dave mentioned how in this business, you got to have that extra, you know, um, edge or you just need that, you know, sk extra skill set to maybe beat out some of the other guys and having all those, not just even skill set. I think it just sounds like to me, you're just really, you know, having fun and being passionate about a lot of different things that, that open, you know, more doors. Yeah, it's, I'm, I've been really lucky that way. And I, and I think, you know, the, the curiosity opens up a lot of doors. And I think people gener genuinely sense, uh, at least high level creatives genuinely sense if you're into what you're doing or not. Right. And, you know, and I, I still, I've been making major label records 30 years and I still love not just major label records. I love working with indies. I love just writing songs just to do it. Um, you know, everything about music is just the fact that I get paid for it is just the cheat code. I mean, yeah, well, you know. what's awesome is, uh, you know, like, uh, most people I, I realize, you know, they're good at one thing usually. And when the trend changes and things like that, uh, they just sort of become obsolete, you know? Right. But like, right. you're like, your career seems like, like a Swiss army knife. Like you, you could just kind of figure out things like any anything thrown at you which is which is awesome and your whole yeah. energy is like awesome i i think it uh you know you you gotta try and pay attention to what's current you don't have to pay attention to what's current you have to pay attention to what's current that connects with you sure. um yeah. you know because you can't chase everything but you have to know what's going on because mm -hmm. as like as a mix engineer i kind of have to know what trends are but as a producer i kind of don't give a shit about trends like i just want to make a great song and you know if we got to tailor the production for this artist or that artist or whatever we can tailor the mm -hmm. production but at that you know that's got to start with a great song for me but the, staying relevant and reinventing yourself constantly if you're going to do this 30 years professionally is <laughs> is a ninja trick for sure it is you know um and i think part of it is survival um and part of it is just uh you know i like when you know somebody like kanye or mark ronson or somebody calls you for something you don't want to say no <laughs> so, yeah, you want me to do up. what yeah of course i know how to do that i don't know how to do that yeah no problem give me a few give me like one day oh two <laughs> you know <laughs> they're gonna be like do you know but, how to uh, fly an airplane <laughs> like, not yet but you know get me in the air and i'll figure yes. out how to land it <laughs> love that oh man <laughs> That's awesome. You know, I mean, just the fact that I think, uh, you know, when it comes to like, uh, you know, like pop music, you know, pop music has so many different elements. Like, you know, it could have like a rock element and, you know, EDM, hip hop and all this different uh, elements. The fact that like uh, you could put all that together, you, you know, that means you're very, very like, uh, like versatile in style, but also like you have this genuine love for like pop music too, right? Oh. Like yeah. I love pop music. Sure, yeah, of course. People are like, how do you, you know, how do you go from creating like a rock song to like this teeny bop, like you know, K-pop song? Right? Next minute, whatever. It's just uh, you got to really love it to be able to do it. I think, right? I think you know, I saw a Timberland interview one time, and he summed it up perfectly. He's like, people always want to pigeonhole me. They want to call me a hip hop producer, or they want to call me an R and B producer. And he's like. He's like, I produce music. And as soon as he said that, that clicked instantly with me. I was like, I don't produce this or that. I produce music. Play me the song. If I think I'm the right guy to produce it, then I'm <laughs> going to take it in whatever direction I feel like that song goes. And I happen to just have so much weird experience in so many different genres that I could produce a orchestra with a for a Christmas pop song, or I can produce a street rap. You know? <laughs> yeah. The other thing about a lot of my hip hop credits is I find a lot of the hip hop guys uh, reach out to me because I can bring other worlds into their world in a very authentic way. Um, like the J. Cole Born Center album would be a perfect example. On Born Center, I produced live strings and live choirs 
and skits for nine songs on Born Center. Wow. And it was 16 strings and it was maybe 25 or 28 uh, people in the live choir. And that was something that J. Cole knew that he wanted something that wasn't just a keyboard. And he, he knew the impact, of, but he had no idea how to get it. And he knew the J. Cole thing I got because of Drake, because I produced the choir on Drake, uh, Lord knows. And then, so J. Cole asked Drake and Drake said, called Just Blaze. And Just Blaze said, oh, that was Ken Lewis. So, <laughs> and then like six hours later, J. Cole's sitting in my studio playing me like early tracks from Born Center. And he played me a, a early version of Crooked Smile before I dug in on it. And, Wow. You just knew instantly the the yeah. rough cut of that was a smash. I mean, yeah. goosebumps. Crazy. Uh, yeah, I you know, I think that's why you're so successful in, in the genre of K-pop because I think K-pop you you do need to have a lot you you have to be more versatile just even in your taste. Uh of course, you know, you bring your own taste to the table, but uh, at the same time there's so many other elements uh, that make K-pop what it is today, you know? And so just as, as K-pop is growing and it's being, um, you know, it, it, it's turning into this thing where it's now, you know, some, one of the biggest music out there, especially with, you know, you know BTS and, you know, Blackpink and NCT. I think it's, uh, I think we need more creators to step out of their boundaries like yourself, you know? And I think that's a, a great example of that, just how, you know, you are able to approach it that way. Well, I think, uh, Mixing for BTS is uh, really stretches me in that way because you know BTS has the rappers you know Sugar J Hope and RM and um, those are the guys that I typically mix for BTS for. So I've mixed thirty six songs for BTS by now, um, and uh, and I usually get the ones that are both rapping and singing. Um, or the rap features only. And so, and I think they like the, the, like my hip hop sensibility and the fact that I can blend that with pop um, and that I kind of know what both worlds are supposed to sound like and how they work well together. Um, and, uh, but, but, uh, you know, I've been mixing with BTS since their very first album and, you know, some you just get lucky with, you know, <laughs> I mean, you could sense something early that they were they were special, but you can't predict the biggest artist. In the, I mean, the owner of Big Hit could, but he was the only one. But he saw it. Yeah. Um, it was incredible. I mean, 2019, BTS is the biggest artist in the entire world. Yep. That is just <laughs> mind-boggling. <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Speaking of uh, BTS, this is a question from one of our viewers. Um, how do you manage working with notoriously large number of tracks, like, for example, like BTS? Practice, experience. I mean, I, I so as a mixer, I try and get into a zone or a flow state of turn the brain off. Just stop thinking about anything except for what's coming out of the speakers and only react to what's coming out of the speakers. And a, an example of that was, uh, I think BTS Hey Mama was about 180 tracks wow. and we mixed it in seven hours. Wow. And we had one tiny revision and it went final. And it, if I'd have needed more than seven hours, I'd have certainly taken 17 if I'd have needed it. It just came together and it was just this, Everything, you know, when you get into the state that decisions become very easy and, you know, mixing is just like breathing to me. I just put shit together and then I listen and evaluate. And uh, I always kind of am able to have this vision in my head of where I want to take it to the finish line. And I just work until I'm there. And with BTS, the, the biggest challenge with them is they have so many different sections. So Hey Mama had five distinctly different musical and vocal sections that had nothing to do with the others. So it, if you can imagine mixing five separate songs and then putting them all together as like the mastering engineer and the mix engineer at the same time, because none of those five different sections had any relation to each other. And you have to make it sound like one seamless song from start to finish. 
So that's the real challenge of super high track counts is not that you have so much to sort out. It's that you have the transitions between sections are nightmarish to make sure that the feel is perfect. And, you know, you're not done until you can just press play and feel like the listener never loses their zone because everything just flows so seamlessly. They don't even notice it's changing. It's just changing. Wow. I love that answer. Ken is uh, somebody that I looked up to during my early days of engineering. And he, at that time, he was the only one that shared a mix session from a major artist and a major label. And um, I think what I got from that ultimately, uh, that still applies to me today when I'm working on projects is that use your ears. You know, I think the mix um, side of everything, it's, it's always about just being creative. And sometimes rather than hearing or trying to be technical as much as possible. As you said, it's about how it feels at the end. Um, then just using the latest, greatest gear there is out there. It's, it's using your ears and making the best judgment possible and make the song feel good. So, you know, that's, that's an amazing answer, man. <laughs> yeah, and vibe is everything. Like anybody can learn how to use the plugins. Anybody can learn how to use the gear. But people like me are hired because of our taste. And either you like what we do or you don't like what we do, but you're going to have an opinion about it. And a lot of people, you know, the people that like what we do hire us. And, and you know, it's, it, it's uh, the decisions of what you feature and what you don't feature, not how crystal clear you make the vocal sound. It's, um, here's a perfect example. I mixed Dan and Decane Damaged was a huge hit in America. And when we, um, when I started the mix, Puffy said to me, he said, there's five girls in the group, only one girl singing lead vocal at a time. But anytime that the other four are singing backgrounds, treat them like lead vocals, even when the lead vocalist is singing. And I was just like, whoa, that changed my whole perspective on how I approach that mix. And if you go listen to Damaged, you will hear those background vocals are out wide and up loud and the energy that they impart to that mix is really incredible. And that was, that that's just a feel thing. And that was something that Puffy knew instinctively. He's like, I know it's going to feel right like this, do this. And I did. And I was like, Oh fuck. Wow. And now I, that was one of those things where you learn from the greats and then you try and, you know, remember and catalog what you've learned and do it again on the next things. And, you know, I'm lucky to, worked with a bunch of those guys that's cool <laughs> um we would love to hear your thoughts on this subject what do you think is the biggest difference in working on projects for the west and uh versus the east i mean in you guys tend to be more organized <laughs> you know? a lot more organized um business is Typically smoother, you tend to be more organized. American labels are still a bit more like the wild, wild west. Um, and, uh, but, but work, work wise, I mean, I, I don't, I guess, I guess the music is slightly different, but I don't really see it that way. Cause whenever I mix something, I just kind of take it in for what it is and treat it the way I think it deserves to be treated uh, let, me, let me ask you one question i mean have you had like the label person actually maybe like after you mix a song they come back to you and say hey uh this part we can't really hear the words or you know what i mean oh in k-pop land yeah or has that ever happened to you um no i you know you'll get you'll get requests to turn words up and down but i get that in american pop too you know, oh, okay. some people are just really finicky about certain words popping in and out. But for the most part, um, I don't get those types of requests. Mm -hmm. And I, I usually don't understand the vocals that I'm mixing, but I mix a lot of foreign Euro European language and Spanish and and Arabic and, and <laughs> Korean and Japanese and Chinese. And it, it's all music to me. I, you know, a voice to me is a voice is a voice. And I know what a voice is supposed to sound like coming out of speakers. And I, um, I don't know. I seem to not have a problem with it. 
<laughs> fortunately. <laughs> um, but yeah, like revisions are a part of the mixing process or the part of the creative process period. And you want to, you want to have the possibility of revisions because you don't want, I don't want to have my work turned in and have the person stuck with whatever I give them. It's, it's a collaborative effort. Making great records is a collaborative effort. I'm not the only one mixing, even though I'm mixing. The producer is mixing, the artist is mixing. You know, they're giving input on the direction of how that song is going. And it's important to make sure that, especially the artist, like tomorrow I get to go mix somebody else's record or go produce somebody else's record. But that artist, man, they have to live with that song for a mm -hmm. long time. So what's, what's make, the, What's like the most number of revisions you had to do for a song? <laughs> oh, 30. 30, wow. Okay, so that's, okay. Because I recently that, did that was when where... That was when the artist just really didn't want to finish the album. All right. And that was, that was <laughs> the, you, after 10, it was the excuses. <laughs> you're trying to make more money while you're trying to fix the mix so they can pay you? Trying uh, to buy some time or something? No, um, no, I think they just didn't want to turn in their album. Like I mix on a flat fee, so revisions are included. Like 30, oh, yeah, okay, okay. it got painful after 10, you know, but, um, but yeah, my, my, the last thing in the world, m my clients will never walk away from me unhappy. I'll revise till the cows come home. I may never mix for them again, but, <laughs> but, but they'll be happy with that mix. <laughs> so, uh. um, you know, it happens, but at the end of the day, like I try and remind myself when I hear that shit on the radio, all of the time spent grinding on that song is not going to be remembered. That song is going to be turned up and I'm going to be going like this in my car while I'm driving going, holy shit, I worked on this fucking song. Wow. That's <laughs> love. That. I have enough of those that the sessions don't matter, you know? Yeah. Yeah, at absolutely. the end of the day, you just remember the good, you know, and 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 the best times that you had during that time. And, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, building relationships here, too, where it's the journey that is important more than it is being like, you know, oh, you're an artist. I have to you mix like this or like that, you know, developing that sound, you know, is, I think, a very crucial part in uh, when you're working with artists or any kind of projects. And it's a very good point that you brought up is that. You know, when a song is released, you forget all those, you know, revisions or hard times that you had to endure. It's just, it's just fun. And you get to listen to the end result, you know, and see it climb on the charts too. That's always exciting. I mean, isn't that what we all strive for, you know? I mean, you know, artists want to share their music with the world. We want to share our work with the world too. And, and, you know, what a buzz when I can turn on the radio and hear something I, I worked on and, and know that, you know, people around the world are reacting to it. That's crazy. We have so much power in music. Music is just so ridiculously powerful. We don't get paid enough, but. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, so we're gonna get a little technical here. Now, um, you have a beast-like setup centered around the SSL console. Do you mind do. sharing your workflow a little bit? Uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm sitting in front of an SSL AWS 900 Plus. It's a 24-channel analog console with a eight uh, eight-channel um, aux returns, master section, com uh, two-channel compressors. It's got an EQ on every channel, 24 faders. It's also a controller, so I can control Pro Tools from the SSL. So it's super convenient. Constantly while I'm mixing, I can hit a button and be back and forth between analog land and digital land at the touch of a button. And it's so much faster than mixing on a mouse. Um, you know, mixing on a console, you can sit back and I can touch five things in, in five seconds and make five very significant changes on my mix by the time it takes me to reach for a mouse and scroll around to where I need to find to click. And the whole time that you're moving your mouse around, your brain is occupying other functions than listening to music. And so for me, being able to sit in front of a console is like, you know, everybody has their thing, but this is how I learned and this is how I really connect. Um, and uh, I'm starting to mix in Atmos now. So anybody who needs Atmos mixing, get at me. Uh, I'm having a blast with it. I love the format. Um, and, uh, uh, I, I feel like Atmos is like the way we always should have been listening to music all along. 
in the middle of it, <laughs> surrounded by it. It's just so nice. Um, <laughs> so yeah. Um, but workflow wise, what else do you want to know about workflow? Um, um, do you just stem everything out from your sessions to your SSL console or, um, uh, I try and so everything goes out of pro tools into the SSL. I try and prioritize the most important things to get their own channels. And then I group things that I know I can treat uh, within Pro Tools and I'll sp uh, spit them out of stereo pairs of uh, faders. Um, so it's a combination of kind of grouping some things and uh, giving as much control over like lead vocal, kick, snare, bass, um, maybe piano or guitars or whatever is like the most crucial elements that I might want to get some hands on and get some SSL EQs or, or compression on. Uh, Mixbus, I actually don't use the uh, SSL channel compressor. I use the Manly Verimu. Um, and I nice. I use it in a way that I have no idea why it works, but it is the fucking glue. It's, <laughs> that thing is beast mode. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, But yeah, I do a, a healthy amount of process within Pro Tools. Uh, um, like, uh, you know, a lot of plugins in Pro Tools, but then everything hits the console and then it spits back out of the console back into Pro Tools. And that is the only thing that feeds the mix bus is the output of the console feeds the Pro Tools mix bus. And then the only thing that I monitor is the Pro Tools mix bus. So I'm always monitoring all of my conversion my whole audio chain, I'm hearing everything that's happening at the very, very end all the time. And I'm just working towards a finish line the whole time. You know, I'm trying to keep a vision in my head of where I'm going and I just go there. It's cool. Awesome. Yeah, I think workflow, I love what you just said about how this is your thing. You know, I think that's what defines us and allows us to really kind of be a lot more creative. You know, we want to take the thinking aspect out and just do. Um, and that was something I remember listening to the uh, the or watching the down on me uh, mix uh, <laughs> um, session. I was thinking, okay, I might as well need to get a console, <laughs> but because <laughs> um, you were just pulling faders up on the on the uh, at the beginning, I was like, that already sounds really good. Um, but then, you know, workflow wise, I think it's definitely think uh, something that I like to highlight because it's it's uh, you know, if you want speed or you want to be able to get better at things like well, defining your own workflow is important. Uh, you're exactly correct. And, you know, there's the stupid debate between, you know, analog and digital, which is better. Right. Neither. They're both great. What separates them is your ability to work within that medium. Mm -hmm. If you are super comfortable working on big consoles and rooms with speakers and, you know, you're me, then that's how you produce your best results. Great. If your best results come from a, a mouse and a pair of headphones in, you know, and a laptop, then man, tons of hits are being made like that every day. And that's a, just a different experience of how you came up making music. I came up making music, working in big studios on big consoles. That was, that was my wheelhouse. But if you're a kid who, you know, came up making music on your laptop, that's probably where you're fastest and most creative and get your best results and this debate about gear and bleh, it's what inspires you the most well, it's absolutely it's creativity speed um and happiness those are the three key things you know what makes you feel most creative what makes you your workflow the fastest and and just what puts you in the zone what makes you happiest working for sure yeah um, so this is for everybody here. What do you, what are some things that you guys like to do or check before sending off a, a song or a mix? You know, of course I, I would listen, try to listen to it in my car. Uh, I think like the low end has always been my problem. <laughs> Either too much or too little, you know? Uh, so if I could get it, you know, in the ballpark and I go, well, let's try to, you know, at least kind of like fix that in mastering or, you know, whatever like that. But, uh, you know, as long as I'm not going overboard or, you know, peaking or, you know, distorting and things like that, uh, I do, I do discover a lot of distortion at the last phase. You know, I would listen to it in the car. Everything's great. Then I would hear it on my AirPods and I could hear distortion. I'm like, Oh, that distorting. And I would solo the track and I'm like, Oh my God, the gain staging was wrong. <laughs> That's like, you know, like retrack it and, 
try to get rid of the distortion, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I, I would cool. say, if, yeah, I would check for distortion. That's like, oh, you know, or peaking or distortion. That's good. Well, I, um, I think for for me, I think it's important that uh, you know, just uh, of course, just to double check everything. I mean, I don't mix as much because you know this guy Ko right here, he does all uh, you know our mixes and <laughs> chief engineer. Here. So, uh, you know, I, as a producer, I just want to make sure that you know everything is organized. As you know, Ken mentioned, organization is a big part of just making sure everything is in line. So I, I spend a lot of time just double checking and. Um, yeah, and, and again, just making sure that everything is, uh, you know, gain stage is a, is a huge part of that. You know, I don't want to dump everything on the uh, on the mixer because we all know that you know, just as mix engineers or as just engineers in general, we get all the problems expected to be fixed. You know, like oh, there's a. You know, it's, it's, it's in the red, make it green. You know, it's like, how do you do, you know, how do, you do that? You know, like, so uh, we, you know, we get all sorts of uh, problems handed our way. Uh, but me more as a producer now, like I, I definitely want to be mindful of that, you know, uh, just thinking from the engineer standpoint and just prepare uh, the session for the mix session uh, before it's out. Uh, one of the, one of the last things that I check before a mix goes out the door is so my studio's on the second floor and and I can walk out the door and walk straight down a staircase and uh, I'll give it the bottom of the staircase listen with the speakers loud in the studio uh, and I'm listening for uh, can I hear and understand that vocal start to finish? Do I understand all of the words? Uh, does it feel like a, a finished song? Do things jump out or is it, does it, you know, feel like the stereo mix that I put together um, combine at the bottom of the stairs or is it out of balance? It, it's really the gut check uh, reality listen for me. And then I'm constantly running up and down the stairs, tweaking little things until I'm done. I'll sit back in, in front of the uh, stereo speakers few more listens and and listen while i print and then i'm done and the assistant does the rest of the work for sure yeah i mean playback systems are like ways to or different settings and scenarios like and finding different parts of the room i think that's very interesting that's a good thing that you brought up is uh, uh one of the studios i used to work at we would just stand in a corner of the room and, and just sit there and listen uh for any problems too and that's that's definitely a good point uh also different uh, listening in different volumes too i think is also very important um making sure that you said like the vocal's still there even if it's really low um sometimes people just like to bump things up but they don't realize the amount of you know harmonic distortion that comes out of that record and it just makes everything sound good but when you turn it down low things sound a little bit you know could sound a little off so Great points that um, everybody brought up. Yeah, I usually start my mix on stun volume. Like first mm -hmm. 15, 20 minutes, I mix very fast and I try and get as much into the mix as fast as possible and just get really rough basic balances in. And I just try and really get myself pumped up and in the zone and get the adrenaline going. And then as soon as I get basic balances, I back the, vo the volume off to a reasonable, comfortable listening volume and I'll, I can just work for hours that way. And every once in a while you bump it up for five minutes and you listen and you make sure the bass is you know hitting the way it's supposed to hit and it's not hurting your ears at high volume, all that shit. And then you put it back down and listen to normal again. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, as you already mentioned, like understanding your room can be a huge thing, you know, like I know not everybody's always going to have the perfect like acoustic, you know, setup or setting, but, you know, you have to learn the environment that you're in too. And, um, you know, anytime we're off in different countries or different studios or different parts of the world, we're always checking how the room sounds. Or at least how it feels too. Um, Headphones that you trust are a super must if you travel. For sure. Um, yeah. Look at my um, acoustics. What, what do you have? <laughs> Look at my acoustics. <laughs> no, <you're laughs> <on the wall>. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice sound absorption while you got there. Yeah. <laughs> so Any time that's recording, the reflections are saying cha ching. <laughs> 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 uh, for the viewers, uh, this was, I just finished watching Narcos, so this is like inspired by that. <laughs> the last, <laughs> the the last season of Narcos. It's epic, by the way. Um, <laughs> so you're the founder of Mixing Night Audio. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? Ooh, I own a plug-in company. How the heck did that happen? Um, so, you know, we, we, 
we founded a, we started mixing night the live free broadcast on youtube and after i got vaccinated and the pandemic started waning here and i could see my clients again and i could travel again i couldn't justify spending three days every two weeks on a show that we give away for free so we had to figure <laughs> out how to monetize it or give it up and nobody wanted to give up mixing night we love that thing so we decided that we would try and put out a plug-in which is Greenhouse. So Green Haas is our plugin. Green, H-A-A-S, it's the Haas effect, which is uh, like a stereo spreader. Um, mm. And that's basically kind of helping us monetize the show and keep it going. Um, and, but, you know, the funniest thing happened along the way, we stumbled across building just a totally badass plugin. I mean, it came out so much better than I thought it would. And I think, one of the things that I realized is like people like me should be developing plugins more because I've been mixing records for 30 years and creating. So the, the things going on, the process is going on in my brain while I'm listening to music and I'm putting things together are kind of on a different process level than probably a lot of people think about. And then I put it all under the hood on greenhouse and make it look, you know, really easy to use. And, uh, Next thing, I got to get you a copy. I got to get all of you copies of Greenhouse. You're going to love it. Are you serious? It. Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah that's... Oh, man, I was going to buy it, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, mean, I, that, saw the, they... I saw the demonstration on the video. It looked, I mean, the, there's like saturation and... It's, yeah, the it's a saturator spreader with yeah. modulation and filters, but it's really just a vibe box. Like, feed it vanilla and the greenhouse it, you know. If something's too sterile, just throw in the greenhouse. And I love how, like, the low cut is, like, grass. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we and, like, have, wet is, like, the, the, the water uh, sprinkler. The, let me, I have it behind me. Let me see if I can share my screen and just show you guys just for one minute so the viewers can see what we're actually talking about is it can you guys see that awesome yeah oh wow so so yeah I'll, let me let me play you two little things uh this thing i just realized i'm learning new things about this all the time um so it's a saturator spreader left side is saturation right side is spreading and modulation here's some automated green haas uh that i took uh, just two loops and and automated them there you go watch the automation That's but dope. the coolest, hmm. wow. the coolest thing that this thing does. I'll give you one more. So I'm gonna play you a, a two-bar mono loop. Everything is dead center in the uh, mono, and I think I'm sending this to you in stereo. Um, when it hits here, the only change is from this to here is greenhouse, and I have everything set to the red infrared uh, setting on the the saturator. This is all greenhouse set to the ultraviolet, which is this really dark, warm, beautiful uh, reverb. And then this is Hulk smash gamma ray. Uh, so it starts mono on it. It's three different shades of greenhouse. Greenhouse, baby. That that is awesome. Yeah, the it's surprisingly versatile. That's the like the thing that I didn't expect uh, at all was putting all of the processes that I wanted to put under one hood gave me so much more control and flexibility than I thought I was going to get, mm -hmm. and it has given the ability to create so many different vibes and sound all with one box. It's replaced half of my. Any kind of vibe plugins are basically it's just greenhouse now. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, uh, but yeah, I find it surprisingly uh, simple to use. Uh, you know, if you can see it, um, there are no uh, parameters, and it's very gamified, and this is all very on purpose. Um, 
you know, it, it, you guys can tell my whole mantra is turn off your brain and focus on the music. And look at this. This is turn off your brain, have fun, focus on the music, don't do math, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and, and just play until you find that magic thing that you didn't even know you were looking for. And, you know, it's like my whole mixing philosophy put into a plugin. So uh, we're <laughs> hoping this is the first awesome. of many. We'll see how well it's received. And, uh, you know, the economics of plugin land are that you have to sell a lot of them to make it worth your while. And, you know, we got a long ways to go, but I think we got a great product. So. Well, we'll definitely, you know, promote that through Talk Back On in our community because I think this is a great product. This is um, Thank you. really awesome, you know. And I love your philosophy behind it because, you know, a lot of times we get so caught up in the numbers and the in the, in the math and, you know, sometimes we forget just the whole vibe element, uh, as you mentioned before. And uh, I think all of us here, we, we talked about that before, um, just how important that is. And sometimes it really is, it comes down to the feeling of it, you know, rather than, you know, the music theories and um, having it being quote unquote proper, you know, or, or doing it the right way. And, um, I just love everything about this plugin because it just shows how everything behind it is just through that feeling and creating the vibe uh, for the song, you know? So it's great. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I can't wait for you guys to get your hands on it. I, I'm, I'm interested to see what your feedback is going to be. I can't wait to try it. Yeah. yeah. Just to add on to what Kairos is saying is, um, you know, like I love tinkering with gear. I love seeing what's under the hood. Um, and um, as you said, though, like when we, when we were talking about taste, it's not always about like having the best LA-2A recreation there is out there, you know. And nowadays I've even wondered, uh, like, hey, I kind of want to make my own version of it or something that has that kind of beautiful ooze um, to it. And I, and I love how you were able to uh, uh, or think of that when you were designing your plugin because that's that ultimately it's it's just about taste and and just being um, inspired without having all the technical know-hows behind it so that's cool man the thing that really surprised us when we started putting the plugin together because my wife named it I was gonna I was thinking like open house or something like that and she and I were brainstorming she was like well what about greenhouse we could do a lot with that and I was like yes okay Instantly, we kind of mm -hmm. knew that, that was what it was going to be. Um, but then we we knew right from the jump that we wanted to kind of gamify it and make it look like fun and just our personalities. We're a couple goofballs, you know. And uh, and we really thought there was going to be a whole bunch of other plugins out there to kind of like Sausage Fattener was the only one out there that, that we saw that was remotely like what we were trying to do. I was I thought everybody would kind of be on, but everybody's modeling and, you know, I like the modeling plugins. I use tons of them, but I like to turn my brain off and just make music <laughs> and have fun. For sure. And, you know, if you're going to be in the studio as many hours as I have to be, you got to fucking love what you do and you got to really enjoy it. And I'm always looking for ways to maximize those things. Yeah, that's a Absolutely. great way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> um, do you have any advice for uh, aspiring engineers, writers, and musicians out there? Um, make sure to back up what you think you want with actual work. Uh, everybody says they want this career, and almost nobody knows what it takes to get it. Um, I think the people on, on this call do. Um, you know, I'm sure you guys have, you know, swum through rivers of shit just like I have. I mean, this, this is, uh, there are such unfun elements about this business. Uh, it is just a really shitty, shitty business a lot of the time. And you, you better love it because if you don't, it's going to just eat you up and spit you out and be on to the next. And I just refuse to uh, let the shitty people in this industry turn me into one. Um, <laughs> so uh, make sure that you love what you do. If you don't uh, think that it's, I mean, there's most people are going to do this for a hobby. There's no shame in that. You know, if I had never made a, a professional career this i would still be making music in my home studio all the time it's you know you got to do this for the love first um and then you know realize that you got to get out there and network uh 
uh, work does not come to you. You have to go get it. And everybody goes and gets it in a different way. There is no one path to the music business. There is whatever path you can figure out. And that's for everybody. Everybody finds their own path and you just have to kind of do your best and make the smartest decisions you can and, and work hard and be a good person and network well and hopefully good things will happen. Well put. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, like uh, turning uh, 15 minutes of fame into a 30 year career, you know, that's a, that's an art form in itself. So much respect. Yeah. You know, people always ask you like, you know, what was your big break? Like, I'm still waiting for it. I have <laughs> never gotten a big break. We all are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where's my big break? Like, yeah. I've, you know, I've got a hundred gold <laughs> records, but none of them was the floodgates. It was wake up every day and work. And it was this session to that session to that session. And it still is. And, you know, um, I have never been one of those people who was just lucky enough to do one thing and then the phone just never stopped ringing, um, you know, but I go out and get it. And... <laughs> I think the general public always assumes that we're making like crazy amount of money, you know, doing this or, you know, like you win an award on TV and people are like, oh my God, you know, this guy is, right. is killing it. The gold records aren't real gold. <laughs> <laughs> the same exact thing. Like, you know, next day it's the grind again. Like, uh, it's just how it is, right? But uh, like yeah. you said, I think, you know, you got to love it to put up with it or uh, to be able to tolerate it, and, you know, and, and fight through. I think most people will give up, um, you know, the, the humiliation and, you know, just the rejection of the business will uh, it's probably hard. break most people. Um, it's hard. Yeah. And it's you got to understand that that never ends. Even yeah. at our level, guys like us get rejected on our work all the fucking time. Yeah. Like, and eventually, you know, and then eventually they go, well, you know, this guy's old, <laughs> right? And then now you're like, like, like the older generation or something and people move on to, you know, so yeah, there's just a constant uphill kind of battle. Like, uh, I think, you know, when you, the minute you stop, you're like kind of going, you know, down the stream, like, you know, you know, with the current, right? So the current's always against you. So it's just, you have to constantly keep moving. Well, I, I think being able to kind of keep yourself um, fresh and, and reinvent yourself is important. It's also important to not get full of yourself and realize that, like, I, part of how I've built my career is by picking up the damn phone when it rings <laughs> and being available for the people that needed me when they needed me, not when I wanted to be available. Um, okay. And when you become the indispensable person when you make yourself the valuable person to that person there you're going to get the next call and the next call and the next call and if you're not the one making yourself the valuable person whoever is is going to get that call and it's not going to be you so that's just the reality of Absolutely. the music business no yeah i love that uh mindset because maybe it's like um i don't know what to call it maybe it's like an old school mindset because i think a lot of people today have this entitlement you know i, I had this uh someone i'm not gonna name who it was because I, I actually don't know who it was it was one of the you know fans that are out there and they they've been kind of sending demos pretty uh persistently and i've been checking them out i check out every single demo that comes through you know my email and um i was just I, you know sometimes i respond late you know and uh there are times like you know one of the guys that are assigned to uh, decade plus music i responded him uh his email two years two and a half two and two and a half years later you know and, uh, <laughs> and I, obviously we don't want that to you know be the uh, always the case but sometimes that's just the way you know it goes and um you know i i, I would go through demos and i'll try to get to them as quickly as possible but one person in particular they uh I, i'm I, I think that you know they email me several hundred times i don't even i don't i you know i can't recall but um, at some point they messaged me saying you know you guys are all the same you know you guys never experienced failure you guys are all you know high pedestal you guys are all do you know like you guys will never understand my pain of sending demos and getting rejected because you know you guys are all you know just go rot in hell how about that and they, they were just going <laughs> ah you know, they were going off. And they, in that moment i just realized like wow like i think people actually think that people that you know have done uh, major records or mm -hmm. you know have reached a certain level of success have never experienced failure when can you said it so well 
majority of our days we go through <laughs> failures after failure and and i think it really takes a a certain character a certain type of person to continue wake up every day excited about what they're doing and continue on to keep reaching you know and, and reaching for your goals and and wanting to do better and, and get better um so i love that I, I think what you just said i wish i can just take that and just send that over to them <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, of course many times we don't respond you know and we we can't but um i mean i love that <laughs> Failure is another word for experience. And if you haven't failed a whole lot, then you don't have the experience to, to know to sidestep that. And one of the reasons that I started Mixing Night was so I could help a whole bunch of people sidestep a whole bunch of fails before they get there. Right. And, uh, you know, 30 years of a lot of failing gives you so much experience that your work just gets really, really good and you fail a whole lot less and you're consistently, you know, your consistency level goes up and up. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the, the expectation and the delivery of top level pros is that when we are called, we deliver. Yeah. And that's a yeah. really tough thing. And the reason that people like us deliver is because we show up on the days that nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And you can't only try and show up on the big important days and expect to turn on the talent like a switch. That's not how it works. You got to be practicing at 100% when you're doing stuff that you know people aren't going to hear, but matters to somebody. And, you know, you you got to look at that as practice so that you are razor sharp and ready for the big calls. When the big call comes in, BTS calls, I don't even blink. Send me 200 tracks, send me 250. I don't care. I'm ready. I've been, I've been, you know, my skills are sharp. I've been working with everybody. So, yeah. um, you know, uh, I always look at it like that. You got to show up ready to um, perform at your best. And that means practicing at hundred percent all the time. Yeah. I love that. I think, you know, you and, you know, Dave and Bob Horn, you, you know, you guys are, you know, some of the few people that are still out there that I, that can deliver that way, you know, and I know there are people that are coming up right now in the industry where they get, you know, maybe five, 10 recalls and they're just like, you know what? I can't do it. You know, and they complain. They say, this is too much. Like how, you know, I got to charge you extra and, and then it, it ruins a relationship and they don't think, you know, long-term and, you know, uh, investing in the relationship and all that. So it's, it's such a strong message. I think it's such an important thing that, you know, our audience hears that, um, because I think, you know, what people see and what they expect, and especially with the, you know, entitlement that I mentioned before, it's, it's very hard to succeed and stand out because everybody else wants to be selfish. They all want their, you know, Grammys, they all want their number one records, but it takes a lot of hard work, like you said, and a lot of dedication. Yeah, yeah it, it definitely does. But man, if, I mean, if you can get to the point where you can kind of I don't even fully call my own shots, but you know, I call enough of my own life. I, I pretty much map out the way I want to live and what I want to do. And, and, uh, and I have, I think enough job security that I'm going to be good. And, you know, you, you give up. I think that's something really, really hard for young people to understand. You give up your twenties so that your thirties are better and your forties are awesome. And your fifties are fucking out of here, you know? that's but you gotta like if you're if you're skating and you're not working hard through your 20s then all of the people who are grinding through their 20s when they hit 30 they're going to be the badasses getting all of the work and working with all of the artists that you want to work with yeah. just when you're like oh it's i'm 30 now it's time to get serious about my music career are you fucking kidding me right now no you're done yeah. And, you know, so the, you know, anybody out there listening who thinks you should skate through your 20s, wake up right now. Oh, uh, yeah. 20s, man. Uh, I, I was, I think I've mentioned this in the previous episodes that like during my 20s, my whole logic was that I wanted to live my 20s twice as longer than an average guy. So <laughs> I just never slept. Uh, I, I know, I know I like either. some people, you know, have this whole thing. Uh, was it sleep is a cousin of death, uh, this kind of stuff. But uh yeah in my 20s i didn't sleep i was everywhere like hey, I'm, ta I'm not even talking about my neighborhood i was in all different countries uh just i knew like princes kings in different countries i, just, I was everywhere uh just like uh just I, it was kind of like my way of uh i guess uh you know the the whole hustling thing right 
the, the getting out there and meeting and networking and all that stuff. Yeah, life so, so, experience. Yeah. And then now you see people in their twenties are like, just like Kairos was saying, like, you know, a couple of emails and they're like, Oh my God, you know, or they just get really I'm disappointed. Yeah. Like you're not going to give me a chance. And like, Oh my God, do you even know the type of obstacles that we went through to get to where we, you know, had to be like, it, it's just, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. I moved to New York city at 22 years old in a rider truck and started work the next day, worked 102 hours, my first week in New York city. Oh, that, that pretty much set the tone for, you know, all of it. Oh, I mean, do, I mean, doing it 30 years is one thing, but doing it at, at, at the level that you're doing it at, that's a whole another art form, but I don't think people really, <laughs> really understand the magnitude of that. You know, mm. you know what I mean? Uh, I mean, some people do work 30 years, but they never had a hit song, uh, you know? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, yeah. I, don't, I Honestly, I mean, some of it is survival. Some of it is curiosity. You know, I just, uh, I like what I do too much to let other people do it. So, <laughs> you know, and, and I love finding, you know, like producing vocals is probably one of my favorite things to do. When I find a great vocalist and I can just really, I find that I have a, a great ability to, to bring things out of a vocalist that they didn't know that they had. Um, and, uh, and I think that's kind of becoming a lost art in our business as well. And, uh, so, you know, when I can really connect one-on-one -on -one with an artist like that and bring this incredible vocal performance out and then produce a great song around them and then mix it, it's like all my skill sets get to come together and, you know, I can bring a song start to finish. It's, you know, uh, the, those are my favorite types of things now because I get to just pull all of my 30 years of doing different things together into kind of you know one focus and were, were you uh were you a self-taught musician or were you trained in i went to or... berkeley college of music in boston um, oh, okay so i graduated uh, magna cum laude in uh, music production and engineering but everybody gets a core music education there hmm. um so you know i'm a hack guitar player uh i can't really play piano very well but um, and I'm a decent bass player, but I have played on hundreds and hundreds of records. <laughs> and the cheat code is you don't have to be a great player. You have to play great parts <laughs> and you have to play the parts that are needed, not the parts that you want to play. I think the, the kiss of death with most uh, studio musicians is they plug in or they turn on and the moment the record light goes on, they think they're the star. And it's blah, 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 or you know, jam all over it. I've gotten on so many records because I just sit back and listen and figure out what it needs and only add that, and and uh, and that's worked really well for me. Um, and uh, yeah, and that goes to taste as well. And it's just you know being tasteful with the parts you put down. Yeah, you sure, I think, I think you're absolutely right about the whole taste thing. You know, there's so many people graduating from music schools every year, right? So just in Korea, I was in, when I was living in Korea, I was living right next to an art, uh, like a music school. So I see students graduating every year. Yeah, I, I think one of the things you were saying about uh, so many young people coming out of music school yeah, every I, year, what, yes. what they fail to understand is that people like me and most successful people went and worked for somebody who was much, much, much better at making records than I was when I was just getting out of college. And I went and I learned by working, starting working for the greats uh, as, you know, an assistant. And then when I was engineering, then I got the opportunity to engineer for a lot of great producers and artists. And like, I learned hip hop from fucking Just Blaze and Kanye West and, you know, Pete Rock. I mean, those <laughs> were my teachers. So, you know, it, but if you, but you have to get yourself in the room. If you can't get yourself in the room, you can't get that extra knowledge. So, you know, whatever you have to do mm. to grind through the, the assistant gig and the intern gig, you know, you just got to do it until it's your opportunity. And, you I mean, but having, having good taste, I think, is such a key thing. Because, uh, you know, a lot of people are, you know, very proficient with music and, you know, like, 
good at instruments and things like that. But like, you know, the, the ones with the good taste ends up being in the room usually, uh, or having, you know, repeated cases of success. I think for sure. Well, talent spots talent. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I we talked about how, uh, you know, being called a legend or being considered a legend before was, uh, you know, sometimes a kind of an old thing. But, you know, I really think that, you know, all the things that you've done, accomplished and, you know, what you continue to share with everybody in the community, I think that really makes you a legend, you know, and um, I really appreciate, you know, just everything that you shared with us today because, wow, like um, so much. I think, I, I think there's so many things that, you know, in our community um, uh, that needed to be addressed. And I think the way you addressed it and the way you expressed uh, some of the topics and, and the questions that we have was just perfect. And I think there's so many things that we can learn from it. I definitely learned, you know, a lot today. So yeah, thank you so much. Really appreciate you. Sure. Um, I will only say I still work way too hard to feel like I'm a legend. Oh, <laughs> like, I mean, you know, if that moniker was real, I should be able to relax a little bit more and <laughs> I've still got the pedal down. So <laughs> but I, uh, but I appreciate it. That's very nice. Awesome. And I appreciate the invite today. That was I. This has been a blast. <laughs> yeah, Great. Oh, it's so Good. awesome to yeah. have you, man. Yeah. Cool. I guess uh, last question is: uh, Do you guys have anything to plug? Um, your social media is your next projects. Your, uh, you know, mixing night audio. <laughs> um. Yeah. I mean, for me. Uh, uh, we just founded Mixing Night Audio. It's a brand new plugin company. Greenhaus is our first plugin. It's a saturator, spreader, modulator with filters, but really it's a vibe box. Um, check out Greenhaus. You're going to love it. Uh, other than that, my career is just kicking right along. Um, I'm hoping for some Grammy love on the BTSB album. So yeah. we'll see if that catches anything. And that <laughs> album just went platinum. So it's they keep, they keep coming. But cool. that's all i got and uh cool. yeah thanks again you mind uh sharing your uh social media and your oh, yeah, and your yeah. website uh instagram is ken lewis producer uh my website is ken uh anything you want to know about me just go to ken lewis.com and that's kind of the funnel um and you know the the basic career highlights if you're still tuning in i got 105 gold records i got like 57 credited Grammy nominations and seven official nominations. And, you know, I've worked on a whole bunch of things for a whole bunch of people and I'm still trying to work on more. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. There's so many gems that were dropped here today, but um, one thing I really like to point out is that your time starts now. You know, you got to take that first step and, um, but have fun doing it. You know, all these the failures, all these uh, um, experiences that you develop are part of and the path to success. So make sure you have fun, guys. And, um, you know, be sure to smash that like button, subscribe, comment down below. Join our community with the links in our accounts below. Until then, see you guys next time.